Hi guys, lovely to meet you. My name is Jake Mason. Uh, I'll give myself a bit of an intro in a second, but um, I'm really excited to be honest um, and seeing so many, so many startup founders and 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 team members on this is is awesome. I um, am very heavily involved in a number of startups, uh, and I know the challenges that you guys face with growth strategy. So hopefully um, the proof's in the pudding, but hopefully I'll be able to shed some light on some of the things that have worked for me in the past um, and hopefully answer some of the questions that you might have in the back of your minds around how to get to the next stage of growth um, and addressing hopefully some of the, the key challenges that you might have. So as I say, my name is Jake. Um, my name is Jake Mason. Right now, I um, am the co-founder of a startup called For the Creators. Um, I am chief marketing officer to another startup um, called ScoreUp. And I am the digital consultant for a really impressive agency called Wake the Bear. Um, my career started uh, working for one of the world's largest media agencies. And I led the media strategy, the digital media strategy for Netflix. Um, and several other massive brands uh, and got some exposure to how those big behemoths work and how they come up with their marketing strategies, how they understand their customers and all the incredible resources that were available. However, that's not where I really wanted to uh, to lie. And I, after six or seven years, I went off by myself and started my own performance marketing agency, ran that for um, around about six years and then ended up uh, going into startup world and, and also working with Wake the Bear. Um, so an interesting journey and one that I've worked with a ton of different startups um, uh, across different continents and across multiple different industries, B2B, B2C. Um, and there are some commonalities in every single one of them that you guys hopefully will be doing some of, um, but perhaps some of it you you won't be doing or some of it that you can improve on. And um, I'm hopeful that in this hour or so, we can um, expose some of the bits that perhaps you're not doing so well and I can and hopefully help you with that. Does that all make sense? Is everyone on board with that? Yeah. Sounds great. Wonderful. Um, I don't know whether we, I mean, I know you said you prepared some stuff. So do you want to go through that first and then I can fill in any gaps with questions that I've got that haven't been covered? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are a number of areas that I wanted to cover here. These are going to be familiar to you. I hope they're familiar to you guys. Um, but I want to go over them because there are some often some elements that are missed. So first one is value proposition and branding. So you guys will have a value proposition and will have branding. And I'm sure you have um, worked on that and, and got something that you feel is pretty compelling. Getting that value proposition right is incredibly difficult and it's something that needs refinement and again i hope you've been told this before but ensuring that you reiterate on that value proposition once every six months and you have calendared diarized times to come back and refine that value proposition is incredibly important because your value proposition is what's going to feed all of your marketing it's going to what's going to feed all of your messaging and it's what's going to feed ultimately what people see um, and simplifying your product and your service, no matter the industry that you're in, is absolutely paramount. Because if someone doesn't understand it, they just won't pay you any attention. And often, as you guys will know, with social media in particular, you get a matter of seconds or milliseconds to capture someone's attention. So you have to be really clear about who you are and what you do. If you can't, and there's the old adage about the elevator pitch, right? I'm sure you guys have been asked for your elevator pitch, but actually what you need is a three second pitch, a 30 second pitch and a minute pitch. And in the three second pitch, if you can't, if you can't articulate what you do, you've lost someone. Um, so if someone come up, comes up to you at the pub and says, what do you do? If you can't articulate that in three seconds, you're, you're dead in the water. Um, so ensuring that your value proposition is translated into a very, 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 very um, short and defined statement, it can be absolutely transformational for your business. Um, and many of the startups that I work with, many of the startups that I'm part of still can't do that. And that's fine. Don't expect to be able to do that immediately. As you refine your proposition, as it changes, you'll get better and better and better at it. But by constantly trying to do this um, over a period of time, once every six months, once every three months, you'll start to get better and better and better at refining, getting better and better at actually communicating 
what it is that you do very, very, very quickly. Um, and specifically, that shouldn't necessarily be the product or service that you do and, and the product or the service that you offer. Often it is the outcome or the pain or the pro or the or, or the challenge that your customers face. And again, I'm sure you had heard, heard this before, but focusing on that pain and focusing on that problem is often the best way to increase your resonance with your audience and get them to actually take notice. It tends to be with a lot of the startups that I work with, they're so close to the product and the service they can't see the wood for the trees. Um, and it's it's a real it's a real problem. This is why you work with external consultants and agencies because they help you to come in and, and, and define what you should actually be saying. But this guy I work with that you, you may know called Daniel Priestley is a um four-time best-selling uh, entrepreneurship author, right wrote, wrote books like um oversubscribed and keep uh, key person of influence. He's fantastic. Check him out if you haven't if you don't know. In his um in part of his work, he talks about doing the hundred questions and the hundred questions are asking yourself a hundred questions about that your, that your customers would ask ultimately, and really delving into what your customers pains are, writing down a hundred challenges, a hundred questions, a hundred issues that they've got. And you end up starting to repeat yourself, but by the end of it, you get a real understanding of your customer because you start to group these and you start to group them into commonalities and then you start to really establish which ones are the most painful problems and what you'll have have down is some problems that you sort of fix and some problems that actually you don't really fix but they ask you anyway and then some for problems that you absolutely fix and you want to get the balance right between problems that you can absolutely fix 100 percent and the most painful problems and you'll end up probably with two or three pains problems wants desires expressed in a way that probably isn't perfect for your target market that's not exactly how they express it but it's probably near there or thereabouts by doing this exercise what you'll end up with is a way of turning your value proposition and your proposition as a business into a communication that's focused on problems and pains and solving those problems and pains. And if you can weave that language in, you'll find that when you start to communicate with your target market, they're far more receptive to it because it's actually, it's uh, you guys will know this, but again, words for the trees. It's not the product and service that they want. It's they want to, they want to stop being kept awake at light and night. They want you to solve their problems that are keeping them awake, that are worrying them the one that when they wake up in the morning. And if you can do that, then it becomes your marketing becomes far more powerful. And also your marketing zeroes in on the people that are experiencing those problems and those pains, because they're the ones that are resonating with your message. And the time wasters, which we all know we have in business, we've got clients, have customers that come and browse and they don't buy and it's a pain in the ass. Those ones will be the ones that are deflected because they're not actually really experiencing those problems and those pains enough in order to really really um engage with your messaging does that all make sense is that all, all clear hopefully that's 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 helping a little awesome um to build on that i wanted to talk a little bit about um how to understand your target market and actually translate some of that understanding into a growth strategy that you can then start to roll out so Again, many of the startups I work with end up going, I need a marketing strategy. Chat GPT, write me a marketing strategy. This is what I do. Great, fantastic first step. Like definitely do that. Um, in order to build on that, you need to build in as much customer understanding as possible because Chat GPT or most consultants will, will say you should be on you should be doing some content for seo you should be on social media identify the right channels and you should do some ads as an example and some maybe some events or whatever um what they don't really what doesn't really tell you is how to actually just communicate to your audience on those channels and what it will produce and what consultants often will produce is something that's relatively bland, bland it will be good but it is not it's not razor sharp and there's actually a really easy process you can follow to turn what is often quite a bland approach into something that's totally razor sharp. Normally you get your channels right just by interacting with ChatGPT or an agency. Normally you get you in again 90% there. What you actually say on those channels, that's the difficult thing. It's it's the message. So the best way that I've found, and I will not profess to be 
this this to be my idea i've totally and utterly stole this from the agency i used to work at so i'm giving it to you guys to also steal don't tell them um is is the path to purchase and again some of you might be familiar with this the path to purchase you will have definitely heard of the funnel and the funnel is the business's way of expressing a customer journey the path to purchase is what the customer actually does so us as a business we want our customers to move in a really nice clear way we want them to move from awareness to consideration to purchase consideration to finally making a purchase and they don't move like that we all know they don't move like that you guys don't move like that when you're purchasing a car or a can of coke or anything you don't think like that you don't move like that you don't move in a fluid motion so understanding that path to purchase is key to understanding what channels you want to be on and crucially what you should be saying on them. So the path to purchase always starts with passive. So the passive phase is when someone isn't looking for something. They don't know they have a need. They don't know they have a want. And then something happens that triggers them to start actively researching. So we'll take a couple of examples here. Let's take buying um, buying a car, and buying a piece of b2b marketing software as an example so buying a car you don't need you you don't know you need a new car you've got a car it's working fine and then you go to the pub this is the second time i've used the pub analogy clear something in my mind um almost christmas you go to the pub and someone talks about the new tesla that they bought or the new i don't know whatever they bought a new car and you go actually I really would like a new car or another example is your car breaks down nice and easy or I don't know th- th- there's a there's a strange noise and actually you just you want to upgrade or maybe you're having kids and suddenly you're like oh my I need a new new car so something happens in your mind whether it be a want so you've met your mate at the pub and they've got a, got a Tesla and you go I want a new car or is it whether it be a need which is my car's broken down something triggers you to start actually looking then for Um, a new car and in that active research process for a car it could be two three years so for me I've got kids I would start my research with like family friendly SUVs or something under however much money and I'd start doing research and I'd go Jaguar that'd be great little little too expensive maybe I need to maybe I need to go for a Nissan Qashqai and um, nothing against an Nissan Qashqai, by the way. I have an Nissan Qashqai, great car, very middle England. Um, and you'll end up refining and figuring out what you want as you move through that purchase process. So you've got passive, um, which people don't know that they're in market. You've got a trigger point, and then you've got an active research phase. As you go through that active research phase, at the beginning, you're researching pretty lightly and as you get towards the end you're really starting to refine so i've got to the point where i'm like definitely not a jaguar i'm looking at a niscan and cash car i'm looking at I don't know, a toyota and those are the two car brands that i'm then considering at that point now unbeknownst to me the reason i'm actually considering those cars isn't necessarily just due to my purchase my my, my research process it's due to the passive bias that i had before i even got triggered so i knew that i didn't want a uh i didn't want a, a skoda because I heard that Skodas are actually not particularly reliable. Or I really wanted a Nissan because actually I really like the Nissan racing team. And that's nothing to do with my research process. That's actually the passive bias that I've already built up in my head. As you as you grow as a business and as your marketing becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, you need to think about this more and more and more. But initially, as startups, you don't tend to focus on a passive stage because you just need to make some sales. You need to validate that this works. You need to prove to your investors that your business model actually works and you can get some get some clients. So normally you focus all the way down the end of the research phase when someone's almost ready to make a purchase decision. And then they get to the point of the purchase decision. So I go, right, I'm going to buy an SM Cash guy. I then go to the dealership or I go online. And do I buy? No, I don't buy because actually something prevents me. Oh, I'm not 100% sure about this. And I go all the way back to the passive phase. All that time and energy is wasted. Or something is wrong and I go back to the research phase. So all that time and energy that that you might have spent as a business trying to communicate to me through that whole purchase journey, is it can be wasted. So what you need to ensure that you're doing through that whole journey is building up the biases and building up that 
the part of that research process which defines you as the perfect solution if you can be the person that introduces either in the passive phase that triggers them that actually is the trigger or in the research phase that helps them build up a picture of what they actually need then you can be the only one that's actually going to answer that need so in order to do that really what you need and i don't know what all of you guys do here but you don't want lots of people you just want the right people and finding the right people is hard we'll talk about some 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 methods in order to do that with paid advertising and also with wait lists in a second and we can dive into that um in a bit and i've got some really useful hopefully examples of how i've done this with a couple of businesses so we didn't talk about the b2b software example but let's cover that briefly now because i think it might be useful again the passive phase might be um a e-commerce com company has a um has a relatively well-oiled marketing machine but they're really struggling with lead generation and they've got a problem that actually they know that if they can bring in a lead they can then email them and actually it can sell some other t-shirts but they can't translate their web website traffic into leads so how how are you going to how are you going to help them do that well ultimately in that passive phase they know they've got a problem you want to be communicating to them around lead generation is actually can be really easy you can convert more people that come on your blog pages into leads and then convert them into into clients and, and customers um as they go through the point of trigger that trigger might be they see an ad and actually it's like your lead generation problem solved and they're like oh my god i do need to do need to sort this, this is a real problem it might be that they have a board meeting coming up and they go my god my conversion rate from my casual browsers through to through to actual conversions on the site is terrible i need to fix it something might happen they'll go through that research period that their research process and what they're searching if it's lead generation at the beginning they're thinking about lead generation solutions they're going to chat gpt they're going i've got this problem what are the potential solutions they're going to google and going potential like best practice lead generation solutions for a lead generation for e-commerce businesses they're then refining it and they're going actually what i might need is a quiz that's that i think that's what i probably need and i can write a blog article and I can get someone to take a quiz about the 10 best t-shirts that fit a certain body type. I don't know, whatever. And then they're going right now they're searching for quiz software. And at the end, they're finally choosing between the relevant quiz software that they, they want to choose. So you can see how they move through this purchase journey. Us as a business, we think awareness, consideration, purchase, that is not how people work. And we need to ensure that yes, design your assets design your, your relevant channels and, and all the stuff that you create based on the funnel, but you've got to consider the path to purchase. So once you've got your path to purchase, and the easiest way to write it down is it's essentially like a circle, passive, trigger, purchase, passive. So people are moving around in that. So in that four, four on those four stages, you ideally want to first start off with writing down what people actually do as they move through this. So what do your customers actually think and feel and want and do as they move through this path to purchase? So any passive phase, you're probably not going to have a lot in there. And that's fine. That's totally fine. But what are they, what, 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 what job titles do they have? What do they hang out? What are they, what uh, articles are they consuming? When they do have a problem and they're not actually ready to actively research, what are they doing? Where are they going? Who are they talking to about this, this, this stuff? Um, where are they getting industry best practice? Uh, who are they talking to about um, who are they who, who are others in their industry that they follow that are influential over them that help them think and define these problems? So you want to think about all the relevant stuff that they're doing around your topic as they're triggered. What are all the triggers? Write down all the all the possible triggers, everything from going down the pub all the way to seeing an ad all the way to um, something breaking. And write down as many triggers as you can think of. And then as they go through that research phase, what does that research phase look like? So where do they start? So obviously everyone's going to have a different research phase, but where would they start? So that might be, they would start on Google. Yeah, great. But with what search terms? It's going to be relatively broad. How are they defining and articulating their problem? And you don't have to include everyone here. Like you could do this. You could take, you could, this could take a day, Like you want to do this in an hour really. Um, and you just need to get it broadly right. So what are people doing in that research phase early on? How are people then moving to a later research phase? What are they actually doing? And when they come to the point of purchase or getting close to purchase, how are they making the decisions about which providers or which brands to choose at that stage? Write down everything you can think of in this in that um, 
in that purchase through that purchase process. And that will then hopefully open your eyes a little bit about how people think and really key where they're hanging out and the questions that they're asking and the qualifiers that they're using to move on to the next phase. Once you've got this, by the way, in order to get more information, there's tons of resources about around the purchase journey and how to like map it on Google, ChatGPT, like YouTube, there's tons of stuff around this. So if even if you just write down like mapping path, path to purchase, understanding path to purchase, stick into YouTube, there's there's tons of content um, from people like me that will help you help you to do this 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 approach, um, and then once you've got that, you should have a relatively good understanding. Now draw your path of purchase again, like another wheel next to next to where you've got all your all your relevant comments, and now you're going to start to map channels. So based on your understanding of what people are doing and where they are moving and how they're moving through. Now you want to start mapping your channels against that. So let's take a few channels. So um, let's take content, so search content specifically, so blog content. So where does that show up? Where should that show up against that purchase journey? So it's not going to show up in one place, right? So it might be that actually right now, you guys are so focused on raising you're just going to forget the passive stage. That's totally fine because you, you you need to focus on making those sales. So in with search content, it might be that you've actually just learned that you've lost someone if they've got all the way through to purchase, like almost to purchase. And there's no point communicating to them because actually they're gonna, they've got two providers in mind and they're not going to buy from you. There's no chance. So actually your content should not focus on for example, how to make a purchase decision in your industry. So like how to choose the best quiz software because you know then they're not going to choose you. It's too late. So you should actually focus your content strategy early on in that research phase and identify some of the, the, the terms that people are searching. So that might be around lead generation in our B2B uh, marketing software example. That might be around helping people articulate and understand their problem with lead generation and actually position quiz marketing and your product as the solution to that so think about your channels that you want to use and what and what role they play and where and try and refine this don't just go search search it's everywhere like because by doing that you're giving yourself loads of work and you're not being targeted with your strategy you can absolutely use search the top of the research phase and also in passive, but just focus on the top of the research phase to start off with for, for three months, then do passive for three months. It's just too much work and you won't get to it if you try and if you try and do it in too many places. And also with your audiences, when you push this stuff out on social, you want them to get the same message again and again and again and again, because they will not absorb it the first time. You want to be saying the same thing eight, nine, ten times for them to really start absorbing it and really go, OK, X business is the business that I really want to be engaging with when it comes to custom t-shirts when it comes to cars or when it comes to b2b software whatever it is um and do that with every single channel so the one that typically is where, where people put it everywhere is social and i'm i'm, I'm saying social for uh, for all channels but you guys will probably typically i would have thought on average be on three social channels each um and that's absolutely fine. I wouldn't say start adding in new channels. Focus on the channels that you're you're currently on. Um, if you're not on three channels, no problem. If you're not in any, that's probably a problem. You probably want to be on one. But even if you're just on one, that's totally fine. Zero in on where in the purchase journey your communications on that channel will focus. Don't try and go everywhere once again. You just want to be on, in one place. Your social, again, it forms a part of that purchase journey. It doesn't need to take someone from passive to trigger to active research all the way through to purchasing in a single post. And, and advertising in particular, people try and do this and it doesn't work. They try and go all the way from passive, take someone from like a passive need that, they, that, that they're not ready to purchase all the way through to purchase in a single ad. And they go, why does my advertising not work? Your advertising doesn't work because you're trying to do too much. You're trying to ask people to do too much. If you're focused on passive and when someone hasn't yet identified their need enough to, put, to, to trigger and actually become active and start researching, 
then your content should focus on helping them potentially articulate that problem in a bit more depth. Like, how are you being kept awake at night by lead generation problems? Read this article. That's all you want them to do. You just want them to go, oh, okay, my that 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 brand is actually really useful in this space. If it's about triggering, then focus your marketing on triggering. If it's about helping people articulate their problems from a research standpoint, help them do that. But try and identify the role of the channel at one specific point in that path to purchase. That will massively help you refine your content strategy. And what you'll end up doing is cutting through far more and reaching the right type of people rather than people who are just like broadly like, oh, okay, fair enough. That's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. Um, so by doing this, you should then have be able to plot your channels against that purchase journey and really start refining some of the messaging that you're going to use in that channel. D d first of all, does that make sense? And is that helpful in any way? Hopefully it is a little. Great. Okay. Fun fantastic. At this stage, Purdy, am I right to just am I right to ask any questions? Are there any questions that you want me to address? Um, there's a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. I, yeah. I don't know how much more you have to go through, but I was wondering two things. Um, one, how did Netflix do it? Could you use them as an example? Like how many yeah. channels were they on at the beginning and um, yeah. what was the message that they were putting out? And secondly, if there's time, maybe we could live workshop with one or two of the yeah, I love that. Here, what they're building and how they should be messaging that. Yeah, for sure. All right, Netflix. I always get asked this question because everyone wants to know what Netflix secret is. Um, now, unfortunately, Netflix secret is having absolutely kick-ass content. Um, it's a quite a difficult thing to do unless you're willing to spend billions of pounds. And I'm sure your investors have deep pockets, but I'm not sure it's quite that deep. Um, the key... So I, I worked on Netflix when they were a couple of years established into the UK market, but their market share was absolutely tiny. Um, so it was 2014, 15, something like that. No, it must be, yeah, 2014 must be. And they had some awareness, but people didn't really know what it was. And Netflix is silver bullet was orange is the new black which you guys might have heard of it's a program about female prisoners in america it's a really good program um and that was essentially what they were known for but it wasn't really netflix it was orange is the new black was was what they were known for so it was more the actual awareness of the program rather than the awareness of netflix now you think netflix and programming you don't think programming and netflix and that was the key shift they needed to they needed to change um, they needed to bring people to Netflix to discover programming, not give them programming to discover Netflix. And in order to do that, we had to demonstrate the breadth of their programming because talking about a brand is boring. No one wants to talk about a brand until they're really sexy. Now we go Netflix or sexy. But back then it was just like Netflix. Why should I care about that? That's like talking about boots. Like, why would you care about boots? I want, I'm going into boots to buy the products. I'm not going into boots to buy for, for, the, for the experience of boots. Um, so, so we needed to talk about the, the shows and help people to realize the moment where they just, you discover something new. And so we created, um, we helped Netflix create behaviors, Netflix behaviors. So Netflix behaviors were things like FOMO. So fear of missing out when someone else is missing a show, watching a show and you're like, God, I really, I, I, I feel terrible that I'm not, not on board with this. Another great one was cheating, which I love you and a partner. If you have a partner, um, it's essentially like cheating on their partner by watching a show behind their back and not telling them about it. Also um, watching ahead. So when you watch an episode ahead of your partner and then you have to rewatch it because you don't want to tell them that you've actually watched ahead. Uh, so there were some really good insights you're able to pull out and actually build campaigns around that. And actually it, they were humorous. And they drew people into the brand a little bit more to enable us to then do some more discovery. And we built some really cool stuff for, for Netflix that enabled people. Like it, we built something called the thermometer, which was really cool, just like the FOMO meter, which enabled people to um, discover what others around them in their local area were watching, what was the trending shows. So we could build this element of FOMO on a wider, uh, wider basis. Obviously, this was supplemented with show focused marketing. So Narcos came out, which is awesome if you haven't watched it, um, like Pablo Escobar. And um, 
that was a big kind of hero piece and a number of other shows came out which were big hero piece but on underneath this they had this really we had this really key piece of marketing and the the the, the key from it because a lot of this is not doable by startups it's just like the budgets aren't there the the bit that totally is and totally is relevant is relevance so we were absolutely like crazily focused on relevance so how can you be super relevant to that one person that's seeing your ad or seeing your marketing and we did this by segmenting our audience into the most minute buckets so as an example we had a very wide audience i think something like 45 percent of the uk population at that point um and we segmented it into 18 to 20, I think, um, individual buckets. So within that, mums were a bucket. So new mums were a bucket. Um, and within that, we then segmented it even further down into like stage of their child, like how old their child was. And then we targeted based on those very, very small buckets with relevant shows but also relevant communications around the behaviors that were relevant to them. So a, a key bit of insight was um, the mothers that were, that did choose to breastfeed tended to be awake at night and they were on social and actually they wanted to watch something that was about 15 minutes long that took them away from being absolutely exhausted breastfeeding and gave them a bit of pleasure. So at that moment, it was actually like very nice, light comedy, really short rom-coms, essentially easy to consume content to put it in front of them and just go, look, just watch this and this will, this will help make your situation better. And actually like being super relevant suddenly enables you to cut through. So, and otherwise, otherwise you would be like, Hey, watch oranges in you black to everyone. And you'd see a trailer and it just wouldn't be relevant. So isolating individual buckets and segmenting your audience in really in a, like with proper minutia can be a really effective way of cutting through because by doing that, you can understand again, like what the problems and the pains of that audience are. And then you can communicate to them on a much more targeted basis. It doesn't work for all brands and it's really hard for startups to do because you're limited in resources, but, you would no doubt heard the term niching and the importance of niching, but I can't stress how transformational this can be. And I've seen so many businesses do this where they've niched and they've gone, God, I'm terrified because I've now got a smaller target market and I now need to communicate to my investors that actually my target market isn't 5 million people. It's half a million people. And now I don't need a market trend of penetration of 2%. I need a market trend of penetration of 15%. Oh my God, this is terrifying. But by doing this, your marketing becomes so much more powerful because you're only targeting, to, only talking to those people and they've all got the same problem. Or maybe you split them in half and actually you've got slightly different problems. Maybe you split them in four. Um, but by, by niching and making your market smaller, you'll find more commonalities. Your messaging will get better and better and better at cutting through and people will care more and more and more about your brand. Um, again, it's terrifying to do. But even if you've got a market, which is you feel very targeted and very small, I would still encourage you, like by all means, keep it, keep it broad, keep it as, as big as you, if you want, if you want to keep it big. But I would encourage you over a period of maybe three months to spend a month targeting a niche audience within it, another month to target the next niche audience and a third month to target the, the third niche audience. So break up your audience into obvious demarcation. Maybe that's job title. Maybe that's where they live. Maybe it's the pain or the problem that they have, but break it up into something and then only communicate to one portion of your market for a period of time and just see what happens. Because what you'll end up doing is you'll end up probably reducing your reach, your overall reach of your market. But those that you do reach will engage with you far more. And you'll end up getting, if you're if you're B2B, you'll end up getting a lot more qualified leads and probably a lot more leads. If you're B2C, you'll end up getting, you'll see your traffic measures on your website go up quite significantly, like your average dwell time, your conversion rate, and you'll end up starting to see the 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 the, the outcome of this targeted approach.
So you can still, once again, like target one market, then target the next one, then target the next one. At some point, you'll become big enough and you have marketing managers and all this kind of stuff that you can then target all, all at the same time and you'll understand which channels you're going to use to target which. But right now, that's one of the best tactics I can recommend to you guys. Niche, 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 niche and become more and more and more relevant. Purdy, did that answer your question? What yeah, was that, that, was, that was really good. Um, Mark, I don't know if you've raised your hand because you've got a question or you want to run through your your business but that's no um yeah i suppose just a quick follow-up on that um i'd love to know jake what key activities you guys ran at netflix to research and understand the audience so well that you could actually segment them that much and how you consolidated all that data and made it usable yeah this is a this is a great question and, and i'm afraid i'm i'm not going to give you the answer that you want here um it's uh it's it's one of those things that big agencies and big brands have have access to these incredible planning tools like um, GWI, Global Web Linux, like um, TGI, which is an amazing survey-based tool uh, that you can pull incredibly incredible depth of research on your customers. And it, they're like 15 grand a year. It's just like out, right. out of the realm of possibility. If you know someone at a consultancy, if you know someone at a big agency, beg, borrow and steal for them to do a run. So a run is essentially they will build your audience into it. So what's your business? What's your audience? Uh, so ironically, we're actually we're building a user research tool, but it's for oh, digital right. product teams. So product managers and UX designers. Fantastic. All right. So you would ask, hopefully you have someone you can potentially ask um, to build that audience into those research tools. And then what it ends up doing is then um, in indexing people against consumption. So it'll index people against consumption of different media, as an example. So where are they actually hanging out? It will help you understand their purchase journey. It'll help you understand the brands and the influences that they engage with. Um, those kind of tools are gold dust because they pull in so much information and then you can spit it out as charts. So you get an amazing 100 slide deck, which is uh, quite daunting, but tells you everything you'd want to know about this audience. And within that, there are normally six or seven key nuggets. You're like, that's a marketing campaign. Oh my God, I didn't know that about my audience. Actually, that's fantastic. That's so interesting. Um, failing that, obviously not everyone's going to have access to that. There are. And, um, only... Sorry to jump in again. What are those tools called? Like, Gemma, is there just that one GWI? Is there like a big... Yeah, end? so Global One went back to is, is good. Um, TGI um, is also good. So so TGI is, is incredible. There are also, um, there's also YouGov. There's paid version of YouGov. So YouGov, um, it's sort of like answers, censors the population, sort of. Um, they incentivize people to ask or answer questions and then enable you to access that data, anomalized, obviously. So you build your audience and then you see how that audience thinks about things and answers certain questions. I think there's a good free version of YouGov, I think. Um, so YouGov is a good one. Uh, and then there are loads of others, but... Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Again, that's a chat GPT. Like what are the best, uh, what are the best consumer research tools? And um, there are absolutely free ones out there. They're not as good, of course, but they are still good. Again, chat GPT, Google it, best free consumer research tools. Um, there is also, in my opinion, all of this stuff can be done on a shoestring budget just by being really smart about how you market your audience, again, if you've got a social following, if, it, if you don't, it's more difficult, but you can you can do this by emailing a database or emailing people. But in my opinion, if you bring your customers on the journey with you, they love it. So not all your social channels will be right for this, but I am um, co-founder director of a business called For The Creators which my wife started. It's an awesome business. It started as fashion rental for maternity. So women get pregnant, their body changes. They want to wear nice clothes still, of course, but they don't want to pay a premium for it and then have to chuck them away. So rental, perfect use case. It's now much broader than that, but that's where it started. And in order to understand the right brands that these women wanted to engage with um, and also how they wanted to rent and the price point they wanted to rent at, the best way was to get information from their customers. So we emailed our database with a simple Google form and incentivized them with like five pound off or something. Um, and also just Instagram stories polls. So we ran loads of polls 
uh, before this, we set it up that we were developing a new thing and we were trying to, and we wanted our, our, our community to feel real part, really part of this. And we we're going to ask them some questions over the coming days and we'd love them to engage. And because of that, engagement rates absolutely spiked with all our content because they were like, this is a startup. I'm part of their journey. I get to help control the direction of their marketing. That's awesome. We got amazing responses and we answered all the questions we needed. We then took that information to those brands and went, there's a thousand women that want for the creators to whist, list whistles. And that's just of our followers. Imagine how many people are going to rent your clothes if you list with us. Uh, and it was a really powerful consumer-led story rather than a brown-led story. And it was something that no one else was going in with and we won whistles because of it. Um, so there are like there are loads of ways to get this information. You just need to know which questions to ask and like loads of ways that i hate this term but growth hack your way to getting the right bits of information out of your customers in order to give you validation um does that answer your question is there any gaps in what i've just said yeah no that's really good i suppose just the final follow-up if i may because there's probably a few other people in this position as well i imagine um i've got very much that head down at the moment building product i guess the priorities are you know launch <clears throat> launch v2 raise funding and then growth would come in last because we we've got a good size wait list we have beta testers right. it's more about it's more about actually really just you know de-risking the actual product side at the moment but i feel like the wait list is probably slowly dying and slowly moving away because i don't really engage with them at all um so i wonder if you had any hacks in terms of I suppose for them, when I talk to them, I feel a bit like Oliver Twist, kind of saying, oh, please, can I have something else? And I don't really give them much. So yeah. if you had any hacks in terms of how to make it a bit more of a two-way street and actually engage with them um, and kind yeah. of keep them, as you say, on the journey, right, as I'm building, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way of doing this, and I don't know whether it's viable, but the best way of doing this is beta, beta testing, and you do not need your full product to beta test. Right. Like if you have in your flow, you might have a, you might have a landing page and then a sign up page and then collect user information. Right. So get your landing page done. The easiest thing to do yeah. and say, we want you, you are the, like, we want a hundred people from our waitlist. So let's say you've got a waitlist of 300 people. We want a hundred people from our waitlist to beta test just the landing page. We're not ready to do the beta, beta testing on everything else, but just the landing page. Would you be willing to do this? And I know this is like, again, you're asking them for something, but they will love this. And you'll get the people that actually are going to end up being customers saying, yes, I'll beta test your landing page. And you'll get loads of information back from it. So that is a first port of call, 100%. Secondly, in your, hopefully in your marketing, in the, in the um, analysis that you've already done, you should hopefully understand some of their pains and problems. It sounds like you've, you've probably got a pretty good idea of what their pains and problems are. You can probably, if you sat on a Zoom call with someone right now, you could probably help them address some of the concerns and the problems and the pains that they've got in their uh, industry and in their business. I would suggest that you sit in front of your desk and you say, and record, on, record to camera and just go, I've been asked these three key questions from clients. You guys have been absolutely amazing on the on the wait list. I wanted to give you something back. I'm going to spend 20 minutes addressing them right now. You send that out to your wait list and you say the three big questions that the wait, this wait list have been asking me addressed. Stick it on YouTube. Get them to view that. It's taking you probably an hour all told. Make it rough and ready. Absolutely fine. But just by giving them something that's only for them, you should, even if they don't consume it, you should hopefully get them to feel like you're giving them something back that's personalized and isn't like, hey, here's some content that we've written that's completely impersonal. Um, by doing that, hopefully you'll be able to engage them. But with with um, a little bit more time, I reckon we could come up with a really, really good, uh, good, good strategy to engage them. What I would say is regularity of com communication is really important. Um, I don't know if you know Product Hunt, but I sign up for loads of um, loads of products that are dropped on that. And then the waitlist communication is absolutely appalling. You just don't hear anything. Even if you're saying, even if you give me someone a countdown, you're saying 100 days until we launch our beta. Even if yeah. you're doing that, that then builds more excitement and just keeps people engaged. So just ensuring that you're saying something to them is better than nothing. Um, and just like with semi-regular communications, it doesn't need to be every week. 
but maybe once a month just to keep them updated with where you're going, keep them updated with the development of your product and also give them a few nuggets if you can, just like that um, that video, hopefully you should keep them engaged and make them feel like they're really getting something from you. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, Jake, really helpful. Yeah, no worries, man. Purdy, do you so, have another question? <laughs> yeah, no, I was just looking in the chat, so... Um, Rob just asked a question from way back at the beginning, which was about how you nail the three second pitch if you've got different parts of your value proposition. So there's a B2C play oh, and then there's question. a B2C play, etc. Yeah, good question. Yeah. <laughs> so um know your audience uh, is the is the easy one. Um so uh um was that Mark? Uh Rob. 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 Oh hey Rob. Um yeah, good question ideally what you want to know who your audience is and, and most of the time you probably will um so you should have one for for both audiences really uh if you're in a room with someone if you're doing an elevator pitch you should really probably know which one you want to want to be going out with um i would almost never do both again i've seen businesses that do this and they try and combine the both it's really hard once again like you want to be focused on just getting some attention getting someone to engage enough that they're like all right, I'm listening to you. Again, conversation in the pub. You don't know someone, you're both waiting for a pint of Guinness. Third, this is the third pub reference, um, if you're if you if you're counting. Um and you say, Hey, how you doing, mate? What what do you do? Or well, they say, What do you do? And you say, So what are you gonna say? Really, what you want to be saying is the most compelling side of the business or the one that's most relevant to that person if you know them even if you don't you still want to only say one side because otherwise it's just going to confuse the hell out of them because you're trying to explain something that's really complex and in order to explain the two sides of it you have to set the whole framework of we operate within this industry and there are two different distinct audiences and we've built the problem we've built the it's just too complex pick one pick one and it doesn't actually matter which one you pick once again just like with niching and audiences it doesn't matter which audience you focus on you're not going to alienate everyone else i know a guy who is a coach for agencies so there are so many different agencies out there there are creative agencies and media agencies like the one i work at like bear um there are communications agencies like, like so many different agencies he has a framework that works for every single agency to get more clients and to sell at higher value really nice and simple but if you talk to all agencies it's just too much and me, I work in a, I work in a media and communications agency. We're nothing like a creative agency. At least that's what I think. We're exactly the same. The model is exactly the same. Like, but I wouldn't want to admit that. But he then focused. He focused on funnel builders. Super freaking niche bit of performance marketing. There are like five thousand funnel builders agencies, something like that, in the, in, in in like the US and the UK. Super niche audience. Most of his clients are not funnel builders. <laughs> Most of his clients are creative agencies or media agencies or what, whatever else. But because he focused on those funnel builder audiences, he cut through and he understood exactly the pains and the problems that they have. It just so happens that a lot of the pains and the problems that those agencies had also were experienced by media agencies, also were experienced by performance agencies. And those agencies come to him and go, I know you only work with funnel builders. Could you make an exception? So you're not you you will not alienate your market just by focusing on one thing. So I would suggest pick one and go with that. And again, the, the example of the pub, the guy that's also buying again, this is like, that's interesting. Tell me more. And you go, well, actually, we've also got a second bit of the business. And I go, oh, right, fantastic. So you just want enough to engage someone, to draw someone in. Again, social media, you got two seconds to say something, something enough to get to get them to um to, to be drawn in and again ideally you build in pains and problems and challenges into that statement hopefully that helps a little yeah thank you Grace, cheers. marco was yours a question yes uh thank you um uh, jake uh, great great hey. insight here um can you answer b2b questions as well yep so, well maybe um, we'll see <laughs> Okay, so so um, I was really intrigued by you know when you were discussing about what you were doing at Netflix and you know with this uh, sort of access to this data, and like is there an equivalent in B two B? So so you know the, the essentially in my line of business, right? So essentially you have users which are essentially techies because it's a deep tech, deep tech product, and then you have decision makers they don't know what the techies do. So so essentially you have to market in a very different way, right? <clears throat> But I guess this would be two different niches, and then you have maybe a medium medium management layer, which are actually responsible for effective 
performance of tech is right and they don't care about the operational side of things for mm -hmm. the whole business but is there a, an equivalent approach to like what you were discussing with like uh, YouGov and stuff like like something where you could essentially find your target audience without hanging out on forums where they don't like you to plug your stuff and stuff like that right you get banned very quickly um you know is there is there a, you know an approach that you could use that is sort of similarly effective there yeah, so the question is, are you targeting the techies? Oh, well, I'm targeting all three. <laughs> it's just, you know, each issue is a different audience, but like, is there, um, you know, who, I, I mean, who, the who, who buys? Who, 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 who's the decision the maker? Decision make, yeah, the decision maker is the C suite usually, or like, the, uh, it depends it, on the size it, of the company, but yeah, the high, what, quite high. What pains and problems do the C suite have? Um, so there is the a. So there's an operational knock-on effect of being inefficient in configuration management. Essentially, they can't get features right. implemented so quickly. They have delays. They can't do yeah. so many projects. The but you need buy-in across all three. You need buy-in across all three audiences, and you need some level of awareness against all three audiences, right? Correct. Right. Okay. So, for, from my experience, the best way to do this is is is, is ch again channel identification. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question directly here, but hopefully this will help. Is, is channel identification and figuring out who you want to communicate with on, on what channel, right? So as an example, it might be that LinkedIn is, is the key channel for you. And you actually, the two different audiences, let's say C-suite and the techies, have completely different things that are going to resonate with them. In that instance, you probably want to take two different completely polar opposite strategies to engage those two. And in that instance, I wouldn't recommend this generally speaking, but you might just want to create two different LinkedIn profiles, two different LinkedIn pages, one that's focused on techies and one that's focused on the C-suite because you actually don't want them to see the same, you don't want them to see the same stuff. For the techies, it's all the granularity stuff. Yeah. It's all the day-to-day, -day. it's actually doing their jobs. It's resonating with them and helping them to, to achieve the outcomes that they want to achieve to ensure that you're seen as a thought leader and relevant. For the C-suite, it's helping them articulate their problems and helping them solve bigger business challenges, which ultimately goes towards saving money or making more money. Um, so yeah. the approaches are, are fundamentally different and the way in which you have to commit, and you've got to do them at the same time. So, mm -hmm. and you've got to raise awareness at the same time. So in order to do that, you ultimately need to figure out what channels are going to target which which audiences. Mm -hmm. So for your C-suite, you they are going to be probably searching and articulating problems that, that center around the business challenges for your techies they're going to be searching and trying to articulate problems that are far more far more technical so most channels are going to sit within both so search you're going to want a c-suite strategy and you're going to want a techie strategy i prefer i've completely not talked about your third audience here um so by hopefully understanding those audiences and their pains and their problems and identifying the right channels you should be able to communicate with them both in parallel it's a tricky thing to do it's a really really tricky thing to do but like uh, in order in order to do both of those things the absolute number one way that i found to do this is case studies and you'll know this already but mm -hmm. case studies are so powerful because you can create case studies that talk to the c-suite audience to the techie audience and to your third audience by articulating the specific problems and problems that the, the the client had that you solved does that help and i appreciate that doesn't like your skirts around the question it, do, do you want to ask a follow-up question do you want me to refine that in any way Oh, the, 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 there is a there is a challenge, obviously, of logistically how they organize this and uh, stuff like. They, I mean, I've seen previously you have groups on LinkedIn and stuff, and then yeah. you would sort of try to funnel people into the right group for them, and then post, I guess, on the group only. Yeah. Uh, um. But then you obviously you lose that bit of that where you announce the post, and then suddenly everybody sees it. Oh. Uh, you just cut out there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, group, groups can be yeah. groups can be pretty effective. A lot of um, it challenges depends. here are logistic, right? Yeah, it it depends on your your objective and where you actually want to focus right now. Like, if you want pe if you need people right now, if you've got enough people using your product and actually you just want to build awareness, that's one thing. And if you want to get more people to actually use your product, that's a completely different challenge. I'm assuming it's probably the latter, based on perhaps where you are as a business. Is that right? In terms of yes, you actually yes. use it immediately. Okay, so actually what you need then is you need leads and you need performance marketing or to, in order to generate those leads. There's not going to be a huge amount of value generating leads for, in, in my opinion, based on the limited amount of information I know. 
generating leads for the technical audience because the technical has to uh, have yes. to sell upstream and that's hard and it normally never gets buy in and, and they then, don't do it and they don't do it absolutely so it's going to be yeah. far more beneficial for you to focus on raising awareness against that audience and you can do that through content mm -hmm. so pushing out and just ensuring people are aware of your your brand name and then for the C-suite audience, that's where you want to be generating leads and conversations. So that's a slightly different strategy. And you can do that again through thought, thought leadership. You can do some like LinkedIn ads is great for this. If you get it right, uh, LinkedIn um, emails, great for this. Uh, again, as you mentioned earlier, but quizzes are absolutely fantastic to this. Building wait lists, wait lists are really good for to engage the C-suite audience. Um, so there are a number of different ways in which you can target them. Also events and uh, introductions, of course, are absolutely, absolutely paramount. But in parallel to that, you need to ensure that you're raising awareness in general with your wider audience. To do this all effectively, it feels that you've got three audiences and you'll have a broader audience around this. So the number one, number one recommendation, hopefully you've done this already, is have a list of 100, 200, 300 companies and only talk to those companies. Again, you'll talk to yeah. lots of people outside them just by proxy, but have a really clearly defined list of companies you want to talk to because then you can create content that talks to the company size, talks to the company culture, the challenges that you know that they're facing, the geographical area that they're in, the specific industry um, regulations and anything that sits around that. And hopefully that will enable you to cut through with those audiences and be really, really refined and also really refine your targeting when you're going after them. Great. Thank you very much. This is really helpful. Thanks. No worries at all. Paddy, I'm conscious we're at the top of the hour. How yeah, we're at time that I think there's like, there's so much more that can be said. Um, if anybody has any follow up questions or wants to chat, what's the best way for them to chat to you? Yeah, I mean, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Jake Mason. Hopefully I'm, I'm relatively easy to find. I look hopefully quite like this. Um, maybe slightly more, slightly more edited. Um, <laughs> But yeah, connect, connect with me on LinkedIn. More than happy to have a chat. Um, as I say, I work with an amazing agency called Wake the Bear. Um, we do consultancy for startups. If you need support, let us know. Part of that is free consultation. So hit me up. Um, it, whether or not you end up spending with us, we can we can spend half an hour, an hour troubleshooting some of your issues. Um, I, I, I really did scratch the surface with what we can go into here. This is kind of some of the more strategic stuff, but there's so much we could talk about in terms of customer retention, in terms of how to utilize success stories and case studies, digital marketing approach, specifically when it comes to paid marketing, which is already really hard to get right straight away. Test and learn and experimentation, um, data-driven uh, like making data decision decisions so there's so much more we can we can get into um i love working with startups so hit me up if you guys want to chat i'd be more than happy to to jump on a call and and, and chat perhaps in the new year because clearly i need to go to the pub based on uh, what i was talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you so much i'll pop the i'll pop your linkedin profile in in the chat for everyone to grab as well we will Fantastic. let you go because we've got another session right now as well so we'll say goodbye thank you thank you guys cheers for your time lovely to meet you all all the best thanks i'm just gonna stop